on your side. WBTV News on Bounce starts right now. Good evening and welcome on this Monday. I'm Brigitte Mack. And I'm Delano Little. Thank you for joining us tonight for Race and Justice, a community conversation. And, you know, we wanted to take this opportunity to delve into something that we talk about so much uh, here uh, on the news when it comes to Charlotte. Just a few weeks ago, the Charlotte community came together to discuss solutions for the negative overrepresentation of African Americans in the penal and justice system. Yeah, and tonight we're bringing the conversation here to WBTV News on Bounce. We want to introduce some of the great minds in the legal community joining us tonight. We have Mecklenburg County District Attorney Spencer Merriweather and retired Charlotte Mecklenburg Police detective of 30 years, Gary McFadden. He's also the host of I Am Homicide on Investigation Discovery. Welcome, gentlemen. Yeah, we're well, thrilled to you. have you here tonight. Glad to be here. We will also speak to civil rights attorney Anita Earls, uh, civil rights attorney James Ferguson, there in the middle, and um, Mecklenburg District Court Judge Kim Best. So thank you all for being here tonight as well. We're going to hear from everyone over the course of this hour, but we want to dive right in. Uh, we want to talk about one particular arrest in Mecklenburg County, possession of marijuana. Uh, why is this a problem? Well, I'll tell you that uh, there are many different ways that we try to deal with marijuana cases as they come in the door. As a matter of law, marijuana cases are a low priority for the state of North Carolina. So that gives us a lot of different options as to how we handle those cases. Uh, when an officer makes an arrest on a case like that, uh, the district attorney possesses the possibility of dismissing that case upon someone attending a drug class. Um, or we have the uh, possibility of uh, giving someone a misdemeanor uh, resolution to that case as well. Uh, so there are a number of different things we can do uh, depending on uh, the record of the person who's actually been arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, which which race sees the most arrests and uh, which race sees the, the least amount and, and why is that and why would that be? Uh, the best way to answer that question is that without question, uh, African Americans and people of color are disproportionately impacted by our criminal justice system. And that's not unique to marijuana cases, it's not unique to uh, any particular type of case. That's just uh, true across the board. Um, so there are certainly uh, things I think we'll get into some of that about how it is that we address that particular problem. Mm -hmm. And we also know that the district attorney's office cannot decide to indict or not to, to charge. What, what goes into that decision? So we, we do actually decide whether or not to indict or, uh, or not indict. What we don't decide to do is whether to arrest or not to arrest. Um, and so when an arrest comes in the door, uh, there are two things that are required of the district attorney. Uh, first, to decide whether or not the evidence actually exists to proceed in that case. And the second thing is to decide uh, what should be the outcome. There are going to be a many, many times when it's a child, when it's a teenager who actually comes before the court, and we decide this is a youthful indiscretion and we should handle it that way, <laughs> meaning that give that person an opportunity to keep their record clean. There are going to be some other times when you realize that it's someone who's selling marijuana out somebody's house and you don't want someone getting shot over that, and the only recourse that you may have is to actually hold that person accountable in a court of law. And um, Gary McFadden, I want to bring you into the conversation because I know you spent so much time with CMPD over your uh, career. How do officers come across these types of suspects? Traffic stops, is it warrants? Mostly if it's traffic stop, you know, you stop someone for a taillight and then the aroma comes from the car. Um, and then uh, you see drug paraphernalia on the seat. Then you get into a question answer thing and then you get into the arrest after that. And most people don't know this, that actually officers can write a citation for simple possession of marijuana and you on your way. But other things kind of complicate that decision, you know, whether you give your name, you know, some other things on the scene, people on the scene may compli complicate that. But simply, we can just write a ticket and they'll be on their merry way. What kind of things would complicate it to the point where they can't just get off with a citation and it's something where it goes toward an arrest and putting them in, you know, to the system. That would be a gun on the seat, gun under the seat, um, open container in the car, underage, uh, driving while license revoked, driving with no license, all those things complicate that, compli complicate that single just sign on a citation and letting them go. Um, also, what type of charge does possession of marijuana carry? So it is a class three misdemeanor. As a matter of fact, you cannot even go to prison for simple possession of marijuana. And the average cost of bail for marijuana charges? Well, for a class three possession uh, case, uh, 
there is a policy that's recently been instituted uh, by our local judges, which basically says that um, if you have fewer than uh, five previous convictions, uh, you can be released from custody with a written promise to reappear, mm -hmm. so there will be no uh, secured bond. Okay. And, and how long can a, a person sit in jail? And is that uniform? Is it, is it two days or three days? And is it for everybody, well, or it, does it differ? Well, again, if it's that possession of marijuana case, in fact, they won't uh, actually be in custody or be in jail for a minute. Right. It's a matter of that once they see a magistrate, they're sent on their way upon that written promise to reappear. Okay. All right. Now, the war on drugs was declared back in 1971 by President Nixon. Do we do we need uh, harsher penalties, or should our uh, justice system lighten up a, a bit on this? We got to do more than lighten up. What we I think we've learned the hard way as a society is that when we talk about drugs, we're really talking about a health problem, not a crime problem. Uh, the crime comes into play when you have people that are preying on people's health problem. That's when it becomes a crime. And as your district attorney's office, that's what we're actually trying to uh, make sure is a priority in our courts. Okay. Suggestions? What would you vote? I think it's education in schools, education at home. Um, most of the schools that I attend and talk to kids, they do not see marijuana as a drug. You know, they just see it as something that they use. And so mm -hmm. that gives them, you know, less responsibility for it. I know there's a lot of debate about this. Is there a thought that this should be legalized? Would that sort of clear this out and make room for other, you know, higher priorities when it comes to crime in our community? Well, I think when our legislature decides to make that part of their agenda, that'll be a very interesting conversation for us to have. Uh, in the meantime, both people who are in law enforcement as well as those of us who work in our courts um, have to follow the laws that are actually on the books. Mm -hmm. um, but I do agree that there are uh, increasing forums where there are such conversations. Any other common arrests in Mecklenburg County? Because we were thinking that possession of marijuana was the most common. We right. found out that, that that's not the case. Is it, there are other, you know, a lot of uh, common arrests. Sadly, I think a lot of people who live in uh, communities across Mecklenburg County will tell you that they are alarmed by the number of break-ins, mm -hmm. alarmed by the number of larcenies. Um, the key is why is it that people are actually breaking in and committing these larcenies? And sometimes it is related to drug addiction. Other times it's related to people who are just trying to steal your stuff. Um, and again, we have to deal with those accordingly and make sure that we're coming out with the right outcome. And I know I covered CMPD for a lot of years when I was on the streets as a reporter, and it's a crime of opportunity in many ways as well. It is. You know, we, most of the time people watch people leave. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if you break in that house and somebody's in there, sleep, then it becomes a, a major problem. And that's the simple B&E turns it on to a first degree burglary. Um, that's when it's a problem. Mm, okay, mm -hmm. but it's something that obviously you guys continue to combat. You, I feel like education, uh, you know, we always talk to police about, you know, what people can do to try to keep themselves from, you know, becoming the next target. And we do, we, we try each and every day to say, this is what you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. But I think education, edu educating kids in school and talking to kids about what they should not do and what the consequences that they will face is a big part too. People can make themselves less vulnerable and that certainly needs to be part of our focus, but we also need to be un addressing the underlying causes of crime. Uh, and sometimes that's gonna mean punishing people and other times it's gonna be meeting the needs that people, the lack of resources that, uh, uh, that brought people into that criminal behavior in the first place. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you for that segment. Next up, we're addressing what takes place during court appearances. The conversation continues next on Battles. Welcome back to Race and Justice, a community conversation. The next topic we want to discuss is about court appearances. One particular arrest, possession of marijuana, we talked about that. For this, we turn to civil rights attorney Anita Earls and retired CMPD detective Gary McFadden still joining us here. Uh, first, Anita, if you don't mind, if you can give us a little background uh, into your, what you've been doing. Yes, um, so for 30 years, I've been a civil rights attorney. Uh, for the first 10 years of my career, I was here in Charlotte um, practicing with James Ferguson and the Ferguson Stein Law Firm. Most recently, I was executive director of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, mm -hmm. and that's where we've been looking at some of the data around marijuana arrests. Mm -hmm. All right. And explain how defense attorneys typically prepare clients for court, if you will. Well, that is, that's an interesting question. A lot depends on the time that they have, um, but certainly you want to know as much as you can about your client's background, 
um, their community, the, what kind of support they have, as well as, of course, all the circumstances surrounding their arrest and, and what has happened with them, and their own expectations and what they want to, um, you know, what would be an ideal situation for them. Those are all, um, if you have the time, those are the kinds of things you'd want to um, work with your client on. And I know that even though you spent several years in Charlotte, you've mm -hmm. now been working extensively in Durham, North Carolina, not far from here, uh, and you have examples of marijuana arrests among college students. And we want to take a look first, because uh, you provided us with some great visuals, at the black population in Durham County. So you see that there. And then the next map shows marijuana arrests across several uh, cities near Durham County. And those are the black marks that are on top of that map. And then the last map shows a close up of Durham and the blue icon on the left uh, represents Duke University students and the red icon represents the number of North Carolina Central University students. Of course, that's a historically black college and university and there are more arrests near Central. So Anita, to you, what is striking about the visuals here? Right. So this data is a little bit dated. Um, each dot does represent a single arrest for marijuana possession. The darker shaded areas are the higher concentration of African American population. And what it really does is it visualizes for us the disparities in um, arrests around Central's campus, whereas not nearly so many arrests around Duke's campus. And yet what we do know from research is that whites and African Americans are using marijuana at the same rates, in fact, slightly higher among white populations. So that, this is just a visual representation of numbers that show the disparities in arrests. And I think we focused on arrests in part because, um, arrests for marijuana possession, because that's uh, oftentimes how people first get into the criminal justice system. And then from that flows all sorts of consequences, sometimes collateral consequences that follow them around for the rest of their lives. Mm. And so if we can stop that original initial arrest for simple possession of marijuana for someone who has no prior record, we can begin to change lives. And you pointed out that the usage among whites and black college students is about the same, slightly Maybe higher more, yes, uh, yes. among white students. Mm -hmm. do, do you think then that that underscores a problem that students of color Black students are, are more targeted when it comes to the arrest. Maybe white students are, I, I don't know if given a pass is the right term, when they come in contact with police versus if you're a person of color coming in contact with. Well, I think there are a couple of points of discretion, um, even if you're just looking at the system from, you know, uh, th from initial contact with um, law enforcement through to an arrest being made. There's actually a couple of different points of discretion there. And I think what the data shows is that the, that discretion has been used in a way that disproportionately impacts students of color. And that's where we want to bring you into the conversation, Gary, because you're saying that police have the ability just to write a citation, but that there are other things that could complicate that. Uh, but is it sometimes no other complication other than, and I'm just going to say it, the color of their skin? That happens. It happens. And I think that we can combat this if we look at the data and then ask for the patterns and practices from the police department. If we can show that and then we can address that in a public forum or we can address that on the campus or we address that at a meeting with the faculty and the staff at the university, I think that we will come out better. But we have to show that the patterns and practices um, against these, like these two universities, show that data mm -hmm. and let's talk about that data um, and then we can go forward. But things like that do happen every I, day. I would imagine that'd be tough to, to do though as far as trying to get the information on what happened on a particular stop and what made somebody decide they wanted to bring this person in or what or not. Well I think we do that now with our traffic stops. You know we have stop data. So you look at that and so the officers can just simply put in why he stopped this person and then if it's for marijuana, if it's for cocaine, then we'll know. I think we look at that data and then we move forward and say this is a problem. By looking at this map you can tell it's a problem. And then we all know college is college. Kids in college do, are going to do kids in college things. So both campuses are probably doing the same thing, but then one is targeted more than the other. And I, I imagine that's where implicit bias comes in. I mean, we've heard CMPD's chief, Kerr Putney, talk about that, and that that's a difficult thing to address and then try to rectify right. within police departments, not just here, but I think across the country. Right. Well, that's when you look at patterns and practices. And you take that data and look at it and say, 
something is wrong, this is a red flag. Mm -hmm. This person is stopping all people of color. Gotcha. Then we can say, could we need to address this problem? And that's what we need to do. Well, and I think in North Carolina, we're really fortunate that we have this resource. Um, over 10 years ago, the legislature passed a law saying that you have to keep traffic stop data, mm -hmm. not only the race of the person being stopped, but also the reason, whether or not there was a search, whether or not there was a, an arrest. And we now have over 10 years of data. Um, it's been collated on a website, opendatapolicing.org, and anyone can go and look at um, their individual police department if they've been stopped by an officer, they can look and find that traffic stop and d determine what that officer's pattern has been, and that's actually a, been a tool for defense attorneys right. as well. And so, I'm sorry, reiterate the name of that website again. It's called opendatapolicing.org. Okay. Because I think people would be surprised to know not only does that exist, but that there is a law on the books that, you know, is, is helping just uh, complete the picture, if you will. Well, I think that we have to move away from these forums where we're just yelling and screaming, you know, the police did this, the police did that. Bring the data, show the data, let's talk about it. Now we have a problem. Now we need to target that problem, target that officer, target that agency. Say, this is a problem, bring it to their attention, we move forward with it. Very interesting. All right, well, up next, alarming statistics showing the jail and prison population across the nation and right here in Mecklenburg County. The conversation continues next on Bounce. Welcome back to Race and Justice, a community conversation. Uh, right now we want to examine the jail and prison population, not only in the United States, but also right here in Mecklenburg County with Judge Kim Best of the Mecklenburg County District Court. Uh, she has been sitting on the court for 10 years uh, with the district court here in the county, as well as attorney James Ferguson II, who is a civil rights uh, icon. So uh, thank you to you both for being here. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, first to you, Judge Best just a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been presiding over um, juvenile matters and criminal matters. I've been a district court judge since uh, 2009, and I have to throw in a shameless plug. I'm a proud Wolverine, go blue. I hope we <laughs> win tonight. Um, but I've primarily been presiding in those courts. I currently preside over family law matters, but I am a certified juvenile judge and have been active in this community conversation. I'm also on the board for Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, which is one of our community uh, programs that takes a look at this entire concept and this issue and has actually served in collaborative manner with our local police force force and others to try and help solve, create solutions to this issue of race and disproportionality and implicit bias. And over to you. Mr. Ferguson, just a little bit about yourself. I'm James Ferguson. I've practiced law here in Mecklenburg County for the past 51 years uh, with my law firm, which uh, has concentrated a lot of its work on racial issues, uh, including the criminal justice system, but for school, every aspect of society, because over the period of time that I've been practicing law, what I've seen is shifting sands when it comes to race, but race is still with us too much. Mm -hmm. So we want to start with the <coughs> charts that Judge Best shared at that sure. panel discussion, and I want you to walk us through these, uh, Judge, starting with how many people are locked up in the United States, and we see that here well, on the screen. Well, in the United States, what we see is that we have approximately <laughs> 1.3 million plus. Uh, it's actually more like 2.3 million persons locked up at any given time. But this chart shows that in our state prisons, we have approximately 1.3 million at any given time, but this doesn't take into account our federal prisons, our local jails, our detention centers, centers and either, even our mental health facilities, which unfortunately sometimes serve as detention op options um, comparatively to uh, our prisons and our state um, correctional um, facilities. Is that number staggering? I mean, are the numbers staggering to you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, as everyone knows, the United States jails and houses more prisoners, more criminals than any other developed country in the, in the, con in the world. So it, it is staggering. You know, for us to be a developed country, you would think that we would have more solutions to this issue and we wouldn't have to house so many individuals who are accused of crimes. Mm -hmm. Well, the next one is uh, a breakdown uh, by race and ethnicity in the Mecklenburg County Jail as of March 20th. Well, as of March 20th, as you can see here, there are approximately um, 1,400 uh, plus individuals who were incarcerated in our Mecklenburg County Jail. And as you can see, 987 
over 50% of them were African American. Of that number, approximately 91% were actually males. So you have this continuing issue of disproportionality of African American males between the ages of 25 and 34 who are housing <coughs> our jails, are being housed in our jails. And what you will also see is that on average, these charts, none of them t actually reveal the churn. We have over 10,000 individuals going in and out of our correctional facilities each year. Yeah. But this is just a snapshot. In December of 2007, we had approximately 22,000 individuals leave our state prisons and other facilities and return to various communities throughout the state with possibly with those collateral consequences and no reentry services to mm -hmm. allow them to fully integrate back into our society as productive citizens. Mm -hmm. And I know Mr. Ferguson, you can speak to this obviously representing so many over the years seeing this sort of revolving door in the Mecklenburg County Jail and how many disproportionately, you know, it's, it's um, persons of color and black men. No question that um, African-American males, young males, uh, are grossly overrepresented in, uh, in our prisons and jails. Uh, as Judge Best mentioned, uh, we incarcerate more people per capita than any other civilized country in the world. Uh, you would think that if incarceration was really a deterrent to crime that we would have the lowest crime rate. It's just the opposite. Mm. We have uh, uh, very high crime rates as we incarcerate more and more people. So we've got to find some other way to address this besides locking people up. Judge Best, back to you. Here's one showing the jail population based off gender. <coughs> Your thoughts on this? Well, it consistently shows you, as I stated previously, that males are predominantly considered to be the offenders. What are the reasons behind that? We don't know. However, I don't want the community and the listeners to neglect the fact that a increasing number of individuals who are housed in our state prison facilities as well as our federal pr facilities are females. And I know, we, you know we're talking about race and justice, but we also have a, an opioid um, academ uh, epidemic going on, a health crisis right now. And a lot of the individuals who are involved in that crisis are actually females. And I've had several cases where those individuals, and I've actually had two cases where unfortunately those individuals were found um, deceased um, as a result of, a, of, a, of an overdose from opiates, but the, our female population is not to be neglected. And unfortunately, a lot of our services are for the men and those individuals who you know, are coming out of our prison systems and we're neglecting our, our ladies, 9% are, are women. Mm -hmm. And I would dare suspect that that number is increasing. So we need to, just like we're having services that are geared toward men, we need to make sure for women as well. We absolutely. And is it a situation, I've always wondered this because you hear about these stories, there are high profile ones right. of women that had a relationship with the man who may have been sort of the centerpiece of the case, but they get pulled into Swept it and up. held mm -hmm. just as much, you know, right. res responsibility, if you will, if not more so, and they might have been, you know, acquainted with the the offender or in a relationship or, I don't know, drove the getaway car. And I, I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts on that when it comes to the, the women who are in our jails and prisons. Oftentimes, domestic violence plays a part in that, and I don't think we can ignore the fact that domestic violence plays a part in those relationships. So a lot of those women are, are scared of the individuals, of the, the intimate partners that they are involved in. That is not to excuse their behavior or to say that this is a reason for it, but we have to understand that power dynamic that's going on. Um, other than that, I'm not sure of the reason behind a lot of these statistics. I know, once again, the opiate um, at, uh, crisis is one issue that is hitting women um, uh, very hard and that we need to pay special attention. But outside of that, when we talk about the intimate partner getting involved in those high profile cases, those are, they're just that, they're high profile mm -hmm. cases. They are not your run of the mill cases, okay. I would dare state. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you also find that uh, just as race is an issue when it comes to crime in general, uh, many of the women that you see uh, who are incarcerated are women of color. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the statistics are much uh, show that it's a much higher rate of African-American women being incarcerated than white women. Yet, the opioid crisis uh, is, is relatively new, being recognized as, uh, as part of the criminal justice system. And we also find that it is uh, being treated differently. Mm -hmm. 
uh, when, when the crack cocaine epidemic, so to speak, came out, you saw black folks going to jail in droves. Right. Now that we talk about opioid problems, people are talking about this health problem, public health problem. And it is a public health problem. That's so it's crack cocaine. It, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to crack cocaine, which is also a public health problem. Marijuana is uh, a public health issue. So I, I think and hope that we're getting away from this notion that somehow we solve every, uh, every problem of society by incarcerating people and too often incarcerating African Americans. I think, and I know we are moving uh, in, in, in a progressive direction in that regard. I think you've got about eight states now mm -hmm. where uh, the possession of marijuana is no longer a crime. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got about 28 or 30 states where uh, marijuana is, 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 is not a crime under certain circumstances. A lot of that's medical marijuana. It's used for medical purposes. So uh, pretty soon, I hope, we'll come to the point where we're no longer uh, criminalizing uh, marijuana. Uh, and, and, and neither should we criminalize opioids and other problems which indicate that people are, are subject to human frailty such as addiction. And we ought to treat that as a public health problem and approach it in that way. Welcome back to Race and Justice, an important community conversation. Now we want to discuss the expungement process, and what we mean by that is how you get rid of a criminal record. Uh, Gary McFadden, uh, retired Charlotte Mecklenburg police detective and district attorney Spencer Merriweather back with us. So uh, first to you, Spencer, explain how the expungement process works. So for uh, certain types of people, uh, who have committed a nonviolent misdemeanor or a nonviolent felony, uh, there's a given period of time in which they have not committed another offense uh, that they can actually have a record expunged. Uh, that means that the, both the district attorney's office as well as the court, uh, as well as a couple of different other state offices have to certify uh, that there has not been any other uh, arrests or convictions. And you were talking about community partners and um, programs that have been created. I know you've been instrumental in creating one of those, Gary, so talk to us about that. One lady, she thanked me when I was getting on my plane one day, and she showed me that she finally got a job. Another young man, um, he's seeking employment and re a resident, but he cannot get it because he has something minor on his record. So things like that, if we can remove them or find some way to help them, I think is vital. But the Council of Elders, when we started, we had that wrapped around the building, but they also came inside and was educated on a lot of things that they didn't know, like who would be eligible and who wouldn't be eligible. Welcome back to Race and Justice, a community conversation. We want to wrap up tonight with a question for all of our guests and simply, where do we go from here? It takes transparency and re-examining our policies with race in mind. I think it takes education in the schools and also educating the parents. Judge Bess? Educating ourselves about implicit bias and eliminating <coughs> barriers to those returning. Um, 100th class for the Racial Equity Institute. Go to rmjj.org for more information. This collaborative has existed for uh, 10 years now. Mr. Ferguson. Back when I served on the um, Commission for Alternatives to Incarceration, we discovered that most people in jail fell into three categories. Those who were African American or the racial minority, those who were not educated and couldn't get a job and couldn't find their way in society, um, and uh, uh, poor. So if we could eliminate poverty, which we need to do by providing more opportunities, if we can eliminate racial discrimination and get our people educated, we will have gone a great step towards uh, improving our criminal justice system. Ms. Earls. Well, as I'm also a voting rights attorney, I have to say being um, educated about voting, remember that you elect judges, you elect district attorneys, you elect sheriffs, you elect judges at every level in the state, and that's a really valuable source of power. So know w what your candidates stand for and elect people who will put in place policies to address the issues. <coughs> Uh, this has truly been such a fantastic conversation. Mm -hmm. I hope you learned something uh, tonight if you're at home watching. I, I certainly, certainly did, did yes. sitting here at the table. So thank you to everyone tonight. We know that you're all incredibly busy <laughs> uh, and you, you had plenty of things to do, but we so appreciate you mm -hmm. making time to talk about something that we feel so strongly about. 
here at WBTV. Part of our job here is not just to, to deliver the news, but to have conversations about what's going on in this community. So thank you thank for being you. a part of thank that you. tonight. And hopefully thank create you. some solutions moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. so, thank you for watching our special edition, Race and Justice, a Community Conversation. We'll have more news at 11 over on WBTV, and we'll see you back here tomorrow night at 8.